to help us focus to this special time together. We meet on various territories. Many of us on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. In the European inherited culture, this is the Thanksgiving weekend. In indigenous cultures, Thanksgiving actually is done at various times during the year, at different harvests and cycles of the year. And from the wonderful multi-faith calendar that we do have as fundraising uh, for our, our youth group, it says that some Cree people in the month, in this month, it's the migrating moon. The month where birds begin their migration south. And I don't know about you, but I've heard the geese flying overhead and their, their beautiful sound calling to each other, encouraging each other on. My name is Reverend Meg Roberts, and I'm lucky enough to be the minister here at the Beacon Unitarian Church. So why is Beacon here? So we're sharing different words from different congregation members um, and in Nancy's words, to build beloved community internally and in the world at large. For our guests and newcomers, we want to offer you a special welcome. To learn more about us, we have information uh, on the facts section on, in our website, Unitarian, beaconunitarian.org. There's also on the homepage, a Beacon Connecting form that you can fill out and let us know who you would like to connect you with, whether particularly me or other staff, if you want to connect into leaders of some of the small groups that you'd like to try out, um, or if you'd like to get our weekly e-news update or a monthly newsletter, that form is the place to go. Also, we invite you and everyone to join us for our coffee hour after the service where we have small group conversation. I'm going to ask uh, Ashley, our Director of Religious uh, Exploration, to welcome the families. Thanks, Meg, and good morning, everyone. My name is Ashley Cole. I'm the Director of Religious Exploration here at Beacon. And normally when we gather in person, we would have age-specific programming. Um, in our virtual world, we have some workarounds for this. So if you're interested in more information on that, I, I'll uh, drop a link to our our page on the Beacon website uh, that has some of our programming. Um, I did just want to speak a little bit about something we have planned for October. Um, as we all know, Halloween is, is in a couple weeks. And uh, in light of a pandemic, we're thinking of ways we can engage together as a community and with our families. So um, together with the Children and Youth Religious Exploration Committee, we have brainstormed a sort of a parade in place or a, a house decorating competition and we need your help for this as well. We need lots of volunteers to sign up. Um, we need at least six locations for uh, this to be a successful event and at least 10 registered attendees to go and look at these locations and um, and vote on various categories that they will fall within. So I'm going to drop uh, is a link in the chat box with some uh, with the sign up for the at least for the decorating portion of that competition. And this week in this week's beacon this week, I'm going to add a bit more information um, specific to the Halloween contest and activities, and I'll be sharing more this week and next as well. So um, also I'll, I'll throw I'll put my um, email in to the chat. So if you have any specific questions regarding either decorating or attending, I'm very happy to answer those as well and uh, look forward to connecting with you more on that. So thank you. Thanks, Ashley. For anyone who would like to join me in chalice lighting, um, I'm going to say some opening words, but you might want to grab your chalice now. Our community knows no bounds. We're not confined by the physical limits of walls or for that matter of what often binds us, restricts us or holds us back. 
we are freer than we know. When we release ourselves and each other from expectations of what is needed for true community. We're here together in space. I see you. I hear you. I love you. And I light this chalice, a beacon of this community, holding us all together here and now. Now, I don't recommend that people go around telling each other to be that they're stupid or threatening to skin each other. Although, you know, I must say sometimes people can do that with words. And we see that in the news these days. And that kind of competition can cause conflict. So in our community, in our village, we, we try and watch out for that. And we aren't able to be in the village in the same way as the story, side by side being together in the physical space on a Sunday morning. But we are able to bring ourselves and each other in creative ways together, like on Zoom, on the phone, sending cards to those in need of having their days brightened or when there's some challenge going on or they're ill. It's also possible to be together in regular phone calls like we've been over the summer and this fall to just check in and say hi. We also are sending theme packets to families to let them know we're thinking of them and that we're walking together in different ways this year. We have small groups to explore our ideas and our life experience. People are meeting up one-on-one -on -one to go on physically distanced walking together. And we are making music in different ways. We're still singing we're still listening to the wonderful musicians in the community that we have. It's not the same, and yet it is something. Something. This village that we've created, that we hold dear. We are connecting and hopefully inspiring and we want to be transforming ourselves and our world, being grounded in our principles. And I think that is something worth celebrating. I'm going to turn it over to Carol, who's got something to share with us. Thank you, Meg. Those are beautiful words. Um, this is your pledge drive update. Last Sunday, the Pledge Drive team introduced our 2021 Pledge Drive theme. Our world is one world. The way we share affects us all. On Thursday this week, we sent out a letter to everyone. Thank you, David, for making it happen when, with Breeze, um, who's part of our Beacon community, about the importance of Beacon to each of us, our plans for next year, and a link to the Pledge Drive page on Beacon's website. There you can look at the vision budget for next year and find information about pledging. And you can click on the link to our new fillable pledge card and fill it in and hit submit. Um, we've already received, a, well, by six o'clock last night, we've got a few more now, but by six o'clock last night, we'd already received seven completed pledge forms. Um, and at $11,214 pledged, we are on our way to the $100,000 goal we need for Beacon. Thank you to the people who responded so quickly and generously, proving that our new online form is easy to use. And you can see from Nancy's screen that she's put some of those representative people on the, on the world there. Um, and we're looking forward to adding the rest of you this week and next week. Uh, after today's service, the pledge team is going to be available to answer any questions that you have about this year's pledge drive. Um, we can even help you with the form if you want. David can create one-on-one -on -one breakout groups as needed to get your questions answered. And you can also phone me or email me as pledge drive chair and I will help you. 
Um, so I really encourage you to go to the website too, just to see the info there. And this links us to a reading called The Church Has Left the Building by Margaret Weiss and adapted for us. And some of our Pledge Drive team will be the readers. And I will start. The church is not a place, it is a people. The church is not a steeple above the tree line, streets and cars. Rather, it is a people proclaiming to the world that we are here for the work of healing and of justice. The church is not walls built stone upon stone held together by mortar, but rather person linked with person linked with person, all ages and genders and abilities a community built on the foundation of reason, faith, and love. The church is not just a set of doors open on Sunday morning, but the commitment day after day and moment after moment of our hearts creaking open the doors of welcome to the possibility of new experience and radical welcome. The church is not simply a building, a steeple, a pew. The church is the gathering together of all the people and experiences and fear and love and hope in our resilient hearts. Gathering however we can to say to the world, well, come in, lay down your heartache and pick up hope and love. For the church is us, each and every one of us, together, a beacon of hope to this world that sorely needs it. Thanks so much to our wonderful Pledge Drive team for all the work you've done, talking about creatively ad adapting to this new world that we're in. And they've invited two people to share um, a testimonial about what Beacon means to them, Laura Redmond and her daughter, Charlotte Moon. Good morning, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving weekend. I am grateful for our Beacon community and feel that my life has been enriched by my involvement here. Because of that, I am inspired to support our community with my time and money. My time at Beacon is, is transforming me. The overall direction of this transformation has to do with becoming a global citizen, more aware of and responsive to people and events outside of my immediate circle of family and friends. I sometimes refer to Beacon as a life school. Each Sunday, we are exposed to new perspectives ranging from inner spaces to far-flung places. The children's story, the homily, and the sharing the plate recipient all invite me to widen my perspective and open my heart a little wider, become a little more aware, more involved, and inspired to be of service. Personally, I find it easier to be of service to others when I feel valued and supported myself. I first felt the support when I attended a religious exploration committee meeting led by Joy Silver. Not only was it an opportunity to weigh in on matters of program curriculum, but equally important, it was also an opportunity to check in, share stories, be seen and heard. That was an energizing new experience for me. Later, I took on the role of co-director of the religious education program along with Heather Brown. I was always learning something new, not just how to put together and present a program, but also deepening in my understanding of Unitarian values. For example, there was the Blue Promise Spirit Play story about a young girl who wanted to turn a vacant lot into a garden. The various adults in her life each pitched in a little to help her realize her vision. The Blue Promise, which corresponds with the fifth Unitarian principle states, we believe in our ideas and act on them. By extension, we support and act upon the good ideas of other people too. So that spirit play story is where I learned that when Charlotte comes up with an idea about doing something good, it's my role to support her as best as I can. And that ties in with another aspect of this life school. 
here at church, I hear about the projects that other Beacon members are undertaking, and I'm inspired to join in and support them to the extent that I can. I pledge money to Beacon because it is supporting my ongoing growth and transformation into a caring and generous member of humanity. And what's equally important, the people here make the journey a rich and joyful one. And now Charlotte will say a few words. I love Beacon because Beacon doesn't need you to know anything for sure. And that's in terms of religious beliefs and things like that, but also in terms of yourself. I can and have on numerous occasions shown, shown up to church wearing some pretty wacky outfits and I've gotten up on stage and says some pretty wacky things and, and uh, <laughs> throughout the RE program I've, I've explored different traditions and cultures and religions. But the coolest thing is that through any of all of that, nobody once has made me feel like an imposter or has accused me of being inconsistent. And I think that is a very important thing growing up. And since at Beacon, we're all still doing that, it works out very perfectly. I love Beacon as a family community. Did you know that last spring, Ashley and her accomplices hunted down every single one of the children and youth and gave us presents, Corona care packages? And did you know that during Joys and Sorrows, people are taking notes so that they can go check up on you later and to make sure that nobody is forgotten. I think it's amazing to feel cared about like that. The other thing I love most is that Beacon genuinely, not just for show, wants to hear from you, wants to hear your life experience, your outlooks, how you express yourself and your creative endeavors to connect, to get to know you. I think that any church is built on connection, but Beacon, the glue that holds us together is our connections to each other. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Laura. That's beautiful. Yes, connections to each other. The goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, this is one of our Unitarian principles and the one that we're exploring this month. Now there are ample examples of war, oppression and injustice for many. So it seems to me quite a task that we've taken on aspiring to live this principle. But if we don't, then nothing changes. It is my belief that when I start healing myself, I learn better how to be part of the healing of the world. Now I'm talking in two parts uh, about this whole and healing in our beloved Beacon community once this week and then again in two weeks time. And this Sunday, it's about starting with ourselves. So how can I start with understanding peace if I'm at odds with myself and those dear to me? Now, I do know that a holiday weekend that connects with family whether it's in person, over Zoom, or by phone, it can be complicated for some people. Liberty is about freedom. And if I don't allow myself to understand the ties that bind me, like consumerism, or how my actions impact the earth, my actions that impact my own well-being, then what does it mean for my understanding of freedom, for my ability to be there for others, who are experiencing oppression. Justice is something that comes within a system in society. And when I'm hesitant to speak up, when someone says something offensive to someone else, where can I learn how to speak up? When I feel guilt and shame as a white person from the dominant culture, when I'm doing anti-racism work, how can I heal those parts of my life that may be getting in the way that are causing that heal, those feelings of shame? 
here at Beacon, we're a whole and healing spiritual community, one that supports each other to do the sharing of these struggles in our lives and ways to learn to do otherwise, to be transformed. We inspire each other. We bring compassion to each other during that time of learning. As Unitarians, we also believe that we are whole already. As humans, we have that inherent worth and dignity from the time that we're born. We may be healing from things that have happened to us in the past or are happening to us now, including this pandemic, which we're all exp experiencing to varying degrees. I consider this kind of healing ongoing. It's like spirals coming back around to the same area, but every time I come to that different point, it comes from a different vantage perspective. And, I, and with every little bit going up the spiral, I understand it in a different way, and I have different experiences to bring to it on how to handle what's going on. I learned that from hearing from other people in our Soul Matters groups, the humanist groups, book club, film night, in our children and youth programming, we learn from each other in the sacred quality of our life experience. When we talk about holy ground, our, the holiness that we can create in our heart, it's about that place of deep meaning and connection. I'm healing myself and it goes on at the same time as I work to heal the world. I don't just have to fix everything in myself first before I start trying to make the world a more compassionate and just place. So how does each of us learn how to heal ourselves? Of course, it's gonna be different for each of us and that's the, the wealth of experience and knowledge that we bring to each other. I think right now, it can be hard to feel at peace. I was talking to a colleague this week and we were sharing about how it's so easy to feel distracted and hard to concentrate. Our energy is dragged down by that kind of COVID lethargy. She described it like hitting a wall. And then she gave me a link to some words by Dr. Aisha Ahmed that really helped her. Dr. Ahmed is an associate professor of political science at the University of Toronto and the director of the Islam and Global Affairs in Initiative. In her research, she has been to many war-torn countries. She writes, first in my experience, this is a very normal time to struggle or slump. I always hit a wall six months into a tough assignment in a disaster zone. The desire to get away or make it stop is intense. I've done this many times and at six months, it's like clockwork. This time, our crisis is global and there's nowhere to run. That's okay, she says. I've had to power through that six month hump before and there is life on the other side. Right now, it feels like we're looking ahead at a long, dark, wintry tunnel, but it's not going to be like that. Rather, this is our next major adaptation phase. We're already, we've already learned how to do groceries, host meetings, teach classes. We found new ways to be happy and have fun and reconnect with those dear to us. And as the days get shorter and colder, we need to be ready to innovate again. She says the wall is real and normal. And frankly, it's not productive to try and ram your head through it. It will break naturally in about four to six weeks if you ride it out. Dr. Ahmed goes on to explain that it's important for us to expect, not to expect that any of us who feel like we've hit that wall are going to be wildly creative right now. If we 
if we can be kind to our loved ones and ourselves and meet our basic obligations like working, eating, sleeping, caring for, for those most in need, some exercise, she says you get an A+. Plus. She encourages us to take short mental breaks or take a shore leave, as she calls it, whether it's figuratively or actually. Read a novel, download a meditation app. Perhaps you watch a film and then discuss it with others at the, at the film club. She encourages us, take heart. We have navigated a harrowing global disaster for six months with resourcefulness, and courage. We have already found ways, new ways to live, love, and be happy under these rough conditions. A miracle and a marvel. This is hard proof that we have what it takes to keep going. I believe that here at Beacon, I'm in excellent company of others that are both whole and healing. We, we have been sharing our insights. We have been reaching out and supporting one another. And I believe that this is a precious gift that we give to each other and that we are also giving to those beyond our community in our lives, as well as those who are coming to now be with us. Those who are looking for a place of loving community like we have here. At this time of year, when we consider how we want to pledge our time and skills and financial commitment for 2021, I invite you to think about the gift that Beacon is to you, to you and others here who you care about, others that you want to get to know better, and those who are looking for a place like us. Dr. Bonnie Henry reminded us this spring of the importance of faith communities in a time like this. We don't heal on our own, either ourselves or the world that so needs us. We need each other and we are indeed in this together because our world is one world. Like our hymn says, its ways of wealth affect us all the ways we spend, the ways we share, who are the rich or poor, who stand or fall. Now, for those who are new to our community, we have pledges from those who are committed to being part of the community as friends and members. We pool our resources. There's no outside group that, that we fall back on for, for our financial resources. We also recognize that people give according to what their budget is and what their present life circumstances are. And I know that some of you are not in a position to give more. Because of the pandemic, some of you may need to give less. So other of us, us, uh, others of us who may be able to increase our pledge, whatever amount feels positive to you, please consider doing that. This is a place that makes our programs available for all ages, for learning and fun, for caring and support. It's a place, like uh, Laura said, it's like a life school where we learn to live our principles. A place like this is priceless in the world we live in. I've heard many of us talk about wanting this pandemic all just to be over, to find an antidote and then get on with things. Now we don't know when such a thing will happen. And I don't think actually we'll ever go back to being the same. How could we after such a huge change in our world? Sandy, a member of the singing group that I'm part of, the Sacred Web Singers, said something that really struck me she said, be the antidote. While we're waiting for a vaccine, we can make the difference towards health, our own health and those around us. We can be the antidote in this village and this village that is connected to all the other villages 
in this world, for we are one world. What we do affects us all. Amen. May it be so. In the times of our individual lives when the struggles are intense, it can help to do ritual together. It can be healing. And in times when we're grateful for what we have, it's also helpful to do ritual. This Thanksgiving weekend, these two things come together, grief and gratitude. So I've adapted a ritual created by Kathy Rion Starr, a Unitarian colleague, who created it about COVID's impact. I have candles here that I will light for different areas that we may feel impacted. I invite all of us as we go through this ritual, each in our own feelings and thoughts and life experiences. I know that there is a big spectrum of the responses and impact to what's been going on. Some of you are experiencing it less and some of you more, and some of us who are moving back and forth along that spectrum. So wherever you are today, let your mind and heart be there as we do this ritual. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is real for all of us, whether we're touched directly or indirectly. Will you join me now as I light these candles of grief and gratitude by saying, after I've spoken about each area, we light this candle. Just where you are, the mute is on and that's, that's fine, you hear. You hear it and, and know that we all hear it uh, in the energy that we create together here. I'll say it as well so you can say it after me. Let's try it out together. When I do this, you'll say we light this candle. We light this candle. Then I'm gonna inf invite you to reflect on what's in your heart and mind without naming it out loud, just in the, that space where you are, or if you would rather just name it, name it inside. I'll wait for a few moments after I've named each area for you to have time to reflect. We'll begin this with, with this area. In recognition of the enormity of this pandemic's impact on each of us, on those we love, and on everyone, we light this candle. I invite you now to name out loud or inside your heart or mind some of the ways that you've been impacted by this pandemic, especially things that might be troubling you right now. in honor and in gratitude to all those working on the front lines in the hospitals, nursing homes, grocery stores, our emergency people, gas stations, and so many other places, we light this candle. I invite you now to name or think of all those, whether you know them or just in your mind's eye, those who are on the front lines in honor and in gratitude.
to send our loving kindness to those in isolation, especially those who we know. They may be isolated due to COVID-19 or due to other life circumstances. And to those feeling lonely and sad, those feeling estranged or troubled, for these we light this candle. I invite you now to name out loud or inside those who you know who are isolated, troubled, lonely, sad, including yourself if that's how you're feeling. I think of my Syrian friends in Delta who are having a very hard time. Thanks, Maroka. Just so you know, in case you come in a little later, we're just inviting people just to stay muted so that we allow everyone to, to think of those people that are, are with them. And we'll have times for joys and sorrows. So if there's anyone who, who wants to name some, some of this, that then... To send our care and concern to all those who are ill, those who are grieving loss and deaths of all causes, for these we light this candle. So I invite you to name quietly to yourself, in your heart, your mind, those who you know who may be ill or grieving. to all those people and the many things that we feel grateful, so grateful to have in our lives. For all these, we light this candle. For these lights of grief, in recognition, in honor, in loving kindness and care, in commitment, for these that we light in gratitude, may they guide us in being the, the head, the heart, and the hands to make our commitments to have this world be a more compassionate and caring place. Blessed be. I'm going to invite Ming Shun to play Gymnopedi by Eric Satie to allow us some time just to sit with our own thoughts and feelings, remembering all that we are grateful for as well in this world.
Thank you, Ming Shun. Very beautiful. I'm going to ask Nancy to bring up a slide about the sharing the plate. How grateful we are for all that you give to this community in time, talent, and treasure. If you would like to make donations, you can do that through the Interact email that's listed on the slide and note whether you want the funds applied to Beacon or our sharing the plate recipient for this year, New West Hospice Society. And I'll ask Nancy to roll through to the next slide and Sue will lead us in singing the sung response. For all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use to build the common good and make our own days glad. Nancy, you can indeed just roll to the next slide because we have some people to thank to support today's service. There's those that you see, including Rachel, our admin support for the order of service. And then the next slide, those you may not see as much, those that are supporting in the background as well as in the foreground. Thanks also to David, Susan, Terrace, and Peg, who will be hosting our coffee hour, which starts about 10 minutes after the service ends. We have some closing words and you can just leave carry the flame up. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other, our service to each other, to the world and to our faith continues until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, be loving. We'll extinguish our chalice and Sue will lead us and carry the flame. And if we put our hands out like this, we'll create a sense of holding our hands together. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Go well.